So we're going to bring to order a growth and natural resources meeting today, the 13th of November. You will note that we are recording this meeting. Um, it is because growth and natural resources committee is usually televised when we're in the big chamber. And there are people who do want to see certain aspects of the committee and have been used to having it recorded, so that's why we're recording or seeing it, so that's why we're recording it today for no other purpose than that. Um, so, so, our goal today is to move as many or all things that we can out of this committee for the new council moving forward. Um, so, I will probably speed through a few things. Uh, where presentations might be long, I will ask them to shorten them up a little bit so that we get through everything today um, in a timely way. Uh, so I'm going to change the order a little bit. We're going to do uh, Brentwood uh, Sewer Improvement Project first. Um, and I think our goal on that one is for Mr. Cox to share some information with us about um, what he knows about from, from the perspective of uh, the person who asked for um, some information on how the sewer um, could sewer pipe could go into his property or not, and then the city's perspective on that. So I think we'll start with this. Let's start with the city first. We do have Eileen Neverett here, and we do have a presentation we can um, give. Mr. Today. Cox, do you want to do the proceed. presentation, or do you want, you want to, to hold it? Why don't we hold? We're going to keep. I mean, I think the idea is we're going to keep this in committee until we can get clarification from the property owner. The property owner that owns the land uh, where the wetlands have been designated, uh, his wife is currently in the hospital having a baby, or had a baby, and so he's not available today. So there's some conflicting information that we have received from the Corps of Engineer versus what he has told me, is that he's interested in having a um, um, jurisdictional determination made for the wetland and uh, but the Corps of Engineers has their understanding is that he only wants to have jurisdictional determination made if it's delivered to him so we've not been able to contact him to get clarification by what he means by that so my recommendation is that we just hold this in committee until his uh, family situation is stabilized and um, and we can have a chance to talk to him. So we're happy to hold it and, and we'll be prepared to come back at a future date. So I think the new council would probably need to deal with that at a new date so we'll just this will be one of the items that we will leave in committee. Is there anyone here that wants to speak on that item before I move forward? Okay. But great. to be clear and just for the record the, the city did do a delineation study and the study was submitted to the Corps of Engineers However, the court um, has not issued a determination because of um, it involves private property, and so we have to get clarification from the property owner whether or not he really wants to move forward with the jurisdictional determination. Anything else for that, Nancy? No, I, th I think uh, that's a good summary of the feedback we got from the core, and um, again, we're happy to hold for a future meeting. Okay, perfect. So again, I'm changing the order today, so we're going to do high impact, high visibility. Next. Carter Pettigrew is here, and we do have a brief presentation with a little bit of the background and um, a highlight of some of the guys, thanks for coming. options <laughs> that um, are available to the council. Put it up right now. I think, yeah, it'll take us, just like the last meeting, it takes just a little bit for the That's computers fine. to sing. So just a little background on this before Carter begins his presentation. Is this is something that came out of the Com Appearance Commission, and to my best recollection, part of it was driven by the Velvet Cloak event that happened on Hillsborough Street, and a determination to determine if a property that sits in one of our main quarters, uh, how do we value those and how would we like to maintain them being able to stay um, to sort of be part of the fabric of our community. And so I think it was the committee's, um, the Appearance Commission's um, charge to try to figure out what that could look like. And I know there's been some iterations in and out of that Appearance Commission and then in and out of this committee. So, um, in, so I think 
policy objectives might be one of those questions. So, Gardner, if you're ready. A um, little background, as, as the uh, chair mentioned, uh, request came to council in 2017, uh, presented to uh, council, they put it to the appearance commission, uh, which referred, uh, brought a, excuse me, put together a report for that, which I'll touch on. Council received it, referred to the GNR, um, and then met in August of 2018, November of 2018, April of 2019. Um, the original report from the appearance commission divided into three parts. They looked at some peer cities uh, that do uh, design review, um, and then they also looked at, but a lot of time doing the potential criteria mapping, uh, as well as put together a proposed design review process for uh, as a suggestion. Uh, in terms of the timeline and discussion, uh, the initial meeting, uh, May 2018, uh, there were a whole host of, uh, I guess, triggers or filters that would qualify for a site review, uh, including uh, down, being in the downtown or having your frontage, um, uh, proximity to seat parks or bus traffic transit, uh, as well as uh, development size triggers, like 30,000 square foot for non-residential, or more than 16 uh, dwelling units or four stories for residential. Um, he asked us to look at some additional um, criteria, uh, including in September 2018, uh, proximity to parks, uh, frontage on high vehicular volume streets, uh, and then looking at reducing that, that threshold to 25,000 square foot, but including all buildings four stories or taller. Um, that uh, the first time we looked at about 25% of projects uh, impacted uh, with these additional uh, requirements uh, or uh, triggers 43%. I think um, you might have thought it was too low at the beginning, maybe too high at the second, so we're looking for a Goldilocks. Uh, you would ask to see if we could find uh, some options that would result in approximately 30 to 33% of projects going forward. So that was a manageable uh, type of uh, number. So um, went back to the drawing board, um, and we had, um, uh, I guess, focus on looking at properties that were uh, removing properties that were rezoned prior to development, because you, you've already seen that as city council. Uh, and then staff looked at geographic filters and actually removing them throughout the city. So it'd be any project in the city that meets those uh, development requirements. And that resulted uh, in 27% of the sample size um, that, uh, that would be impacted by this. Um, in April 2019, we presented that. Uh, there was some additional discussion about uh, looking at um, going back to criteria near parks. Um, uh, there was a discussion, but I'm not sure if we had a, a clear direction on the proximity to parks and the kind of reduction in size uh, to trigger those. So we did not calculate that, um, that additional. Uh, but uh, in terms of looking at uh, the impact year by year and type by type, um, uh, sample size, pretty large, well, nearly 400 projects, um, resulting in about 20, like I said, 27%. But if you do look at the last three complete years, 2016 through 2018, that it goes a little higher to about 30% of the projects. Um, in the discussion, uh, staff mentioned that the Appearance Commission had put together a list of concerns it had uh, uh, raised or had come up with throughout its years of working at administrative alternates. Um, you wanted us to bring that back to you, we did. Uh, we also mentioned that there were some of these concerns that might be addressed by some of the recent or upcoming text changes that were in the hopper or some of the other initiatives the city was going through. We found out uh, many, if not most, were uh, we thought would be addressed or have been addressed. As, as uh, staff has put together some possible options for next steps. Uh, one would be to continue to refine the criteria policy options. If we want to look at that, uh, the parks criteria again, we can we can add that in the mix. Um, uh, could also recommend specific criteria that we've talked about. Uh, recommend that to city council who would recommend that to planning commission for review. Um, you can send it back to the appearance commission uh, to look at some additional review or recommendation. Uh, and finally, we looked at uh, possibly removing it from consideration, having no action. I'm here to answer any questions. Thank you for that update. It's been a while, so it's good to have the update. Mm -hmm. Is there anybody here who wants to? S I see Brian, so I assume he's here to s talk, to speak on this. Are you, Brian? Yeah. Is it fine here? Do I have to speak into the microphone? Can you hear me? I don't know. Am I supposed to mm -hmm. be somewhere specific? I think you can. I think you. You're fine. Okay. Fine. So Brian O'Haver, two two three Southwest Street, Raleigh two seven six zero four. I just want, because you're right, Ms. Crowder, the, it has been a while, 2017 when we started this process, and for those who probably know, 
I was the chair of the Appearance Commission at that time and I actually chaired that committee. So I'm not necessarily here to speak for or against, I just want to make sure we understand how we got to where we are. Um, the, the first question I have is the 33% number, it seems like there was a request to staff to get to the 33% number. That seems more arbitrary to me. <coughs> we met for probably about three months total, I think, not every week or some weeks we didn't meet, but it was about a three-month process. In the first couple meetings, our, um, most of our discussion was around how do we really create this framework and determine where these areas are that's defensible from any number of positions. And what we landed on that I thought made a lot of sense and what backed into this 25% number versus starting the other way, excuse me, was we looked at areas where the community had agreed to invest public funds, i.e., bus rapid transit, Dorothy and Dix. There was a number of these that we felt like we weren't a commission that was a, just arbitrarily picking a number of additional reviews. We started with the framework that this is where the, the community has decided they want to invest, so let's start with those corridors and we backed into it. A lot of those square footages we determined through the existing code, looking at parking and other things and some of the regulations that were in the code. So again, those weren't arbitrary. We spent a lot of time, well, I say we did, but Carter and Joe and all the folks at Urban Design Center did an incredible amount of work, an incredible job on providing this information. And we ended up with this 25% number. And I guess the last thing I just want to make sure the recommendation of the Appearance Commission um, was that we worked hard to propose a process that did not protract the length of the current process, but allow this additional step for a board that's made up 50% of designers and architects, et cetera, to be able to provide input, but in a recommendation form only. So essentially it wasn't quasi, we kicked around the idea, do we even want to try to tackle quasi-judicial? That was pretty quick, like no. Okay, well how do we force applicants to provide these improvements? We can't, but at least in a public forum, we're having public discourse, and in front of the whole community, the, we're forcing that applicant to say, thank you for your input, but we're not going to do that. And so we felt like maybe that pressure might be enough to uh, get some better design. So I just wanted to share all of that to make sure we understood kind of how we got initially to where we were. And I, I felt like, maybe I'm biased, um, I felt like we did a, a great job of um, meeting Mr. Stevenson's request, uh, taking into account staff time, taking into account the developers and the length uh, of, you know, considering their concerns about adding another step to the permitting process, and really built it around something that we thought was pretty defensible no matter who started asking us questions about how did you come up with these numbers. So I just wanted to share that, and I'm happy to answer any questions. I, Probably can't remember back that far. But <laughs> thank that's you. generally what happens. So, yeah. Thank you, Brian. I yeah. appreciate that. So, thanks for your work and the staff's work. I think one of the things is since we're at the end of this council and there is a lot of um, change happening, maybe sending it back to the council, this council, at our next meeting to decide whether or not um, this does it have policy objectives it would like to. Uh, refer to the new council or whether the council would just let it um, sit in their committee I mean sit at the council table and let the new council decide what it needs to do might be the best way to go for this one any thoughts uh, yeah, well my <clears throat> my only concern about this um, issue the entire time was that uh, when we first looked at it and we looked at the projects that would be impacted by this they were all concentrated primarily downtown and uh, and there are high impact high visibility projects outside of downtown and so my goal has been to make sure that we have a policy and process that's fair and equitable to the entire city uh, that if we're going to you know spend money and resources and evaluating uh, so-called high impact high visibility projects then we should be doing that throughout the city and not just in one location well. geographically and so as long as we've captured that concern, uh, I have no problem referring this back to uh, the council. Well, since you're going to be on the new council, you'll get to ref refresh their memory as to what your objectives are, just to speak in terms of Brian and 
where we were originally and where it came from, it was because it was a historic building or it had it had value as it relates to the architecture of the time and the period on what was considered a ceremonial corridor and sort of got altered completely and taken down and so it was sort of in terms of not being brought across the city it was because they were looking at these sort of ceremonial quarters if you will and historic or things that could be historic properties to begin with it wasn't I don't think originally it was determined to be citywide but to see what we could do as an impactful way from the appearance commission's perspective in more of the core of the older part of the city yeah I understand that but but again you know, I'm looking at it from as a representative of the people who live outside the Beltline, and uh, a lion's share of the people in this city do live outside the Beltline, and they pay a lion's share of the property taxes, and they therefore they are entitled to uh, have the same resources and same consideration as, as what is being extended inside the Beltline, and uh, uh, and that's the concern that I have, and, and my constituents have, and I'll continue to. Uh, voice that concern with this issue. So okay. can I just ask staff for yes. clarification? So, uh, well, let me give my own little history lesson. Yes, uh, for, for me, uh, the terminology high impact and high visibility, of course, this relates not to rezoning cases where there is a public process, but to site plan approval that is all staff driven. There's no public involvement in it, uh, but with an awareness that um, Our UDO is, uh, has kind of minimal design criteria built into it. And so that there are times when we might end up seeing um, what some people would consider a big, ugly building that they have to look at every day when they drive down a major thoroughfare. And so my concern was, okay, this is an opportunity where now appearance commission is already reviewing uh, design alternates. So they do get a chance to say in those cases, hey, have you, you know, we're design professionals, <laughs> have you considered doing something here that will enhance the public realm at little or no additional cost to the project? And I thought that that is a, a benefit that um, belongs in a small number of cases. Again, uh, if, if 25 or 33 was an arbitrary number, maybe so, but obviously we were very cognizant that we didn't want to overload staff or the Appearance Commission, so we wanted to find a starting point and then test it with a smaller number and then see if that was enough to, to get the kind of benefit we were seeking. So um, you know, we talked in terms of impacts, just the scale of the building or the traffic generated uh, in terms of visibility. In my mind, it was always, I don't care if it's in the cul-de-sac in an industrial park, I don't care. You know, I, what I really care about, ceremonial corridors or other high visibility corridors where a lot of people have to look at these buildings every day. And so that is an opportunity to say, okay, let's take a little bit more time, think about the appearance and how that can uh, be potentially improved, again, at little or no cost, uh, to the benefit of the city. Uh, um, so um, I never thought that we would have a specific geographic area that we were looking at but it really was except that you know highly traveled corridors and then really not geographic ones that have a, a big impact on their surrounding and so um, the question i have for staff is how have these guidelines come down in terms of having a geographic or non-geographic bias i'll call it well the um the last um, discussion in April um, that basically removed any sort of geographic filter and it was through city throughout the city and it would be by development size the 25,000 square feet or larger for non for non residential uh, greater than four stories or four or greater than stories um, for all projects and then larger than 16 units for residential okay see again I imagine that a big project in a industrial park why would we ever want to subject that to an aesthetic um, evaluation so so I would I would say that I'm, I'm still back where I started which is to say if it, if it 
if it's not in a high visibility location, let's never go there. And how do you de define what is high visibility? Well, just one that gets either a lot of ceremonial trips, like Beautiful Street, or um, uh, you know, one of our major arches, like Glenwood Avenue. And it, you'd always, I think, uh, or at least in some areas, most areas of Glenwood, you'd say, you know, we really do care because a lot of people are going to end up looking at that. And you know, someone wants to put up a, a big you store it building there. Well, let's talk about <laughs> how that fits into our image of, of of ourselves as a city. But again, only in those high visibility cars. So I guess I'm I'm still right where I was at the beginning of Brian. It looked like yeah. you might have had a comment you wanted to make. Sure. Can I talk twice? Yes, you may. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Mr. Cox, I appreciate your comment. And we, I just want to make sure again, I'm not agreeing or disagreeing with your with your stance. I just want to make sure that it's clear that we had a lot of conversation around that as well. So it wasn't like we ignore that. And I think if you look at, and I'm not defending the plan. I'm not saying it's perfect. There was a recommendation, so there's probably stuff that. Well, still I mean, if I, if I can just jump in here real quickly. I mean, when we first looked at it, it was it was nothing outside the belt line. In terms of well, I, I, I'm that sorry, I, I it was just a disagree because I remember very clearly and originally. Well, that's and not what was presented to us. When it was presented to us, all the projects that were illustrated in the map were inside the Bell Line, mostly downtown. There was nothing outside the Bell Line. So, so I can't speak to that because we weren't invited to present. So that might have been what was presented, and I would venture to guess that maybe at the time. That those were the majority of the projects that were going on at the time that were identified. But it's it's there in black and white in May 2018. We're talking about city growth centers, major park, bus rapid transit, 16. I mean that stuff occurs way outside of DX. The only thing that mentions DX is the very first item. So again, not agreeing or disagreeing with you. I just want to make sure you know that we we did look at that. There was a lot of conversation. Maybe we came up with the wrong recommendation, but I just want to make it clear that we were well, concerned. I'm not, I'm not saying that what we were presented was entirely your recommendation. I mean, maybe there was some filtering that went on between the time of what you recommended right. versus what we saw. But that, what that we saw well was uh, basically projects that <laughs> they weren't in my district. And right. Uh, maybe I'll just close that the easier way to say was. If that was presented, that wasn't the intent. We were trying to look at the city as a whole and to tackle a pretty difficult situation about how do you define what high impact, high visibility is. This was just a term that Mr. Stevenson threw out at the time, and we're trying to define this and make it defensible. So just want you to know that that wasn't the intent, if, if that's what occurred. Thank you, Brian. Yeah. So I think what we might do is just send this back to council and let council make a decision which way they're going to go with this. OK? Yes. That's fine. Agreed? Let's move on to Z619. Take a minute. Yep. So again, this was, um, while he's pulling that up, I'll, I'll help fill time. Thank you. This um, is a rezoning. Your, the hearing is still open. Yes. Um, you have set it as a date to be determined at your next council meeting. So in theory, the committee um, would make a report back ahead of the um, hearing at your next meeting, although the council at that time could choose to keep the hearing open. Reminder, and Travis will correct me if I'm wrong, at the point that you close the hearing, the applicant would have 30 days then to submit any am amendments to that. Um, as you think about your next step, you might want to be mindful of the calendar and available council dates. As we get into December and gen in January, there are limited council touch point options, so that may be something that, um, that both the applicant and the council want to consider in thinking about when you close the hearing and how you might choose to keep the hearing open. Just a reminder that there is only one meeting in December, council meeting in December. Okay. Great. So I can remind you quickly of the details of the case. Um, just under two acres in a block down by Martin, Harrington, Davy, and West Street uh, in the warehouse district downtown. Uh, the request is to rezone from downtown mixed use with a five story height limit to downtown mixed use with a 20 story height limit, uh, maintaining the shop front frontage <laughs> designation uh, with conditions. The request is inconsistent with the future land use map and is inconsistent with the plan overall. 
the central CAC voted in favor 15 to zero mm -hmm. um, if affording affordable housing conditions were offered. Um, no such condition has been offered. And the Planning Commission recommends approval, 6 to 1. Uh, this is a look at the site. Uh, just of note, there are two parcels interior to the site that are not included in the rezoning request along Harrington Street. Uh, running through the summary of conditions for you, there are some high impact uses that are prohibited. Uh, provision for a pedestrian connection with a minimum of seven feet uh, from Martin to Davy Street through the site. Um, specification of building materials for the first floor. Um, there's language that preserves the uh, existing building facade on Martin Street. Um, height is regulated by this zoning exhibit, which has um, multiple step backs um, to the eventual 20 story height um, towards the center of the block. Give you a second to look at that. Um, buildings constructed adjacent to the railroad right of way that would otherwise not have any transparency requirements because they not front street right of way. Um, por those portions of the building that, that meet that requirement all along the railroad right of way would be constructed and built to the transparency requirements of a public street. So to create um, that public street feeling in conjunction with the zoning condition that creates a public walkway there. Um, buildings that are designated as contributing to the National Register District would be um, photographed and documented and provided to the city historic preservation staff prior to demolition. Um, there is a dedication of two outdoor amenity spaces at uh, two intersections, um, Martin Street and Harrington and Martin Street and West Street. So at two ends of the block, um, two 1,500 square feet uh, amenity areas and any structured parking has standards for uh, screening and covering uh, and uh, opaque vertical surfaces. This is a look at the change in zoning entitlement from the five to 20 stories. You can see the residential density going from 85 to 240 units per acre. Uh, and uh, so that total entitlement is about 450 units. Um, I'm not gonna run through all of these numbers, but you can see the increase, which is in relation to the requested height. The future land use map identifies this whole block uh, in the much of the surrounding area as community mixed use. That is um, in uh, reference to the small area plan as, <coughs> area as well. I'll touch that in just a second. Uh, you are in the downtown on the urban form map and within uh, a transit stop area it is adjacent to Raleigh Union Station. Uh, this is the downtown West Gateway plan. Uh, it identifies the property in this purple area and proposes a maximum uh, height of four stories and 30 units per acre. Uh, this is another look at that area plan showing the original intended location of the transit station. We know that that has moved. Um, it shows it right here. And so now we know it's a block south. And this is the policy breakdown, consistent with urban form, inconsistent with future land use map, and inconsistent with the plan overall. Um, and these are the recommendations you receive from your boards and commissions. I'm happy to answer any questions. The public hearing is still open, as Nancy mentioned, um, and it was open on the 6th. Thank you. Any questions for staff? No. If not, the applicant. Good afternoon, uh, Mac Paul for 21 Fifth Street. Just as a reminder, we have um, a little bit of an unusual situation in that we have three separate owners who have joined together here. We have Gad Smith with Cam Raleigh, Harry Fields, and Charles. Along with center line where HG Raleigh is in the center of the block. And I'll just, uh, I'm not gonna rehash, we had a lot of conversation. I think today is really to discuss affordable housing. Um, we have been discussing that and investigating it since the very beginning of the process. And as you heard um, at the CAC, there's a lot of discussion in the Planning Commission. In this room, we had two very lengthy committee of the whole meetings. And up until we got to this point, the applicant has been resistant to, but very um, interested and committed to 
pursuing it and has done a lot to date, and I won't rehash that unless you have questions, but had not offered a condition relative to affordable housing. And I think a planning commission, given the, the way the conversations played out and the information that was provided, kind of got comfortable to, with where we were. Councilor Stevenson, and I know others of you, um, in the hearing last week, uh, brought the issue up and, and pressed the applicants to look more formally at a condition. And so since Tuesday, there have been a lot more conversations um, to consider what, and we, we kind of got to a point looking at uh, micro units because that offers a way of, of getting to workforce housing in particular, just through the size of the units, which it kind of works out to about an 80% AMI. So I, I feel like uh, where we are today, based on the conversations over the last week, the applicants um, are getting to a point of comfort and wanting, willing to offer something. The, the one thing that has come up, and we appreciate the comments at the last meeting about the height, because what we, I think having some additional height as the other projects recently that have had affordable housing, both you know, are 40 stories there, there are some economies that come with the, those levels uh, that would lend itself more toward being able to, I guess, commit and know for certain that there's a, an aspect of affordable housing. More than 20? More than 20. I mean, it was what we heard from, both from um, Councilor Stevenson, we're here to discuss it today, but I think the feedback uh, in terms of talking to development partners, and of course, you know, CAM's a museum, they're not a, a developer, and they're you know, investigating this. Gary Fields has done a lot of the lion's share of, of the conversations um, and looking at, you know, if, if we're gonna try to commit at this point in the process where we're still kind of early from a development program. So, I mean, we would ask you to, to work with us in considering additional height that would help facilitate a firm, a condition, incorporating a con condition to some level. And I think that we, we would, um, we talked a lot about the micro units. I think that the, the condition doesn't have to necessarily specifically address micro units. I think it could just hit the AMI, mm. the, the affordability, and if you got to it through micro units or you got through it some other way, you still you know, meet the requirements to simplify. It'll be similar to the Rust bus approach. Um, so, you know, that's what the, the feedback we would like to provide based on the conversation. I think that was primarily the, the focus of the hearing. So, uh, you know, just, sorry. Sorry. Mr. Thomas, go ahead. I was just curious if <coughs> parking is going to be in the proposed bill. Good, good question. And that's one thing that now, I, may, I think it would be best if Gary speaks to this because the question we had immediately was, you know, what about parking? And if um, we do have affordable housing as a condition and we need some additional height to get to it to make the numbers work, what does that mean from a parking standpoint on the site? So if you want to just say some of the feedback. Sure. Um, <clears throat> the good news is in the city, the parking ratios seem to be coming down. Uh, not rapidly, but they are nonetheless coming down. And uh, in speaking with other developers, uh, real estate, other real estate experts. So we feel with the additional height, we can provide some additional uh, housing units, uh, perhaps also some more office space. But that could help with our financial side to provide affordable housing uh, element to our, uh, to our project. Uh, in terms of parking, I think we estimate uh, parking in excess of 950 spots over the nearly two acres. Um, those numbers might go up a little bit if we have additional height to support uh, to support the uh, the uses. Uh, so, uh, and the other thing may be that with smaller units, there may be less demand for parking in those smaller units. Uh, we're, we're seeing that workforce. A lot of those people work in the area and uh, may not require the parking density of other users. So. so, so you would be thinking like two to four stories of parking for 900 parking oh, no. for 900 parking spaces. You yeah, how many stories? Uh, probably about nine stories. Yeah, nine more than that. Similar to the Dylan. So, 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 Mac, I just have a question for you. 
So for me to mitigate some of the inconsistencies that are currently on the project, and I think you and, uh, and your client, and I've talked about this before, my goal was to give you more opportunity to build more units in a micro unit. You're right down there at transit and at the bus where the new bus station is going to be. The opportunity for us to mitigate some of the inconsistencies by allowing you to build micro units or what I've heard is called apartments, that they can get small, uh, is to give you the opportunity to build more units. And building more units gives more people the opportunity to live near transit in smaller spaces. And we hear all the time that we're looking for flexibility in the cost of living downtown. And these, th this would stay in giving you more height for you to do 80% of AMI, you only have to hold for 15 years, doesn't ultimately accomplish the goal of trying to have as many people being able to live downtown near transit as we possibly can. And viewing micro units and being committed to putting them in the conditions gives me a level of ability to know that you are also committed to the fact that we want less cars, which would require less parking spaces, which would require less parking for you to have to build in the unit in the building itself. So I, I think well, we, the, we require uh, our minimum amount of parking. But I, I think the idea of letting us help you be even more successful by building more units really should be the conversation that we're having. So thank you for the comments. And I know we had a lot of discussion. And, and I think the micro units still are the, the focus and, and the interest. I was just suggesting that we, I mean, we're hearing some not conflicting things, but I guess different ways to address, to get it a similar goal, which is more housing that is attainable near transit. And the micro units certainly are one way of doing that. I was merely suggesting, I think Councillor Stevenson was off suggesting a, a menu of options, micro units being one among several of the ones that we have used with these recent cases. Um, but I don't, I mean, we're not opposed to micro units. I mean, if that is more, uh, if you're looking to just I hadn't heard you say you want that and not these other options or in terms of getting to the um, affordability. Well, you and I talked, and your clients, mm -hmm. we've talked a lot about mm -hmm. the fact that I wasn't wed to affordability here. I was wed to more of a micro unit where you could build more units because we're closer to transit. Um, so I'm sort of standing where our last conversation was at in terms of micro units being an option here. That's just me. Okay, and again, I mean that's where where we are in terms of the it, the internal analysis and, and the conversations. We were merely trying to fit that into a template that the city has been using. Um, you know, this is kind of new right. territory. I don't, you know, I. Um, oh, that's a good question. Sure. How much height do you want, and how many unit affordable units are you proposing? Yes. Well, I think we were looking at um, ten percent, following kind of the rust bus approach. For 20 a minimum of 20 units and the greater of 10 percent or 20 units and then it may be speaking to the height issue because where kind of the where the numbers of units fall into um, a good a good model <laughs> like in other words you know there's some economies like we obviously we're used to seeing the stick built five story you know this one and then you kind of jump to a more durable construction and I know that the, the um, Envision tomorrow kind of spits out a number that is not necessarily realistic in terms of the site and what could be built so I think yeah. Gary in terms of what you're hearing in, in yeah I, I mean I think we would like with the height to be able to probably uh, have 20% or more uh, residential units than we were originally contemplating uh, and, and again, how much may depend on the parking requirements uh, in, in large measure. Uh, the only reason we, I, we're leaning more towards doing in terms of uh, percentage of AMI is because what we're not sure of is yet, in that marketplace, will there be acceptance of micro units versus just smaller uh, studios, smaller one bedrooms, some smaller two bedrooms, that can accommodate, can, can make it a very affordable product 
uh, for that, uh, let's say, 80% of AMI? Um, or does a true micro unit uh, make the most sense? Uh, there were some people with some doubts that a 350 square foot uh, studio is a product that would be accepted in this marketplace versus a 475 foot um, uh, studio. So I'm not sure we know the answer to that yet. We're excited about the prospect of micro units, but obviously you don't want to build them and find out there's no market for it. And yet we've committed to it for a long period of time, but there's not the market acceptance of that. And we might have been better off offering at 80% of AMI and just assuring uh, the council that we're going to do that and succeed in doing that. So, so our zoning options are 20 and then we jump to 40. So are you asking for 40 conditioned that you would build 10% maximum of, of either 10% or 20 units given 40 stories in height max? Yes, but I think it's not likely we'll go to 40 stories. It's not very likely given parking considerations and other considerations. But uh, Mac, maybe you can address how we would do that for a little legal standpoint, but uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's something we can address in the conditions. 40 is just the base, the next the map from the base standpoint. Right, but then you'd have the condition that it would be 10% affordable housing um, with a minimum of 20. And Correct. Yeah. Okay. Which is, yeah, again. So, uh, all right, so now, can I jump in? Yes, so, sure. So, um, I am, um, Cautiously optimistic. I mean, if we get to uh, an affordable condition here, that will be fantastic. I, um, my fear is that things will get slow walked and that we'll end up with nothing. I would love to get something really quickly. And in that regard, we are in early days. We do have a few precedents out there. The, the Kane project at Peace Harrington gave them the menu of the three options at, at, at to go 40 stories um, the rust bus building they had a little bit different take on it much more complex project with a bus facility on the ground floor uh, but we there said okay well just um, you know guarantee us go 40 guarantee us 20 and depending on how many units you actually build because it might be more or less of an office building uh, that uh, we'll get 20, we might get more than 20, uh, depending on, again, separate developer, not a rezoning, um, in, in terms of what the ultimate developer selection is. So um, I am I'm excited about micro units because exactly what um, Councilor Criver said, which is those uh, don't revert to some different price later <laughs> uh, when the, the our current options for affordability run out at 10 or 15 years or so. Um, but I, I am excited to hear that you're interested in, in making a, a commitment to this because uh, we're, you know, we're not everywhere everyone might want to be in terms of affordability. In terms of height, I think we are where we need to be. This is an area that is, um, transit central for the city of Raleigh it provides yes we are in a market environment where people still require parking to finance and to live and but this is the place where we'll have the very most opportunities for people to leave their car in the deck and use other modes of transportation so they won't be congesting the streets um, so if we can get to Everything I've heard so far is a reasonable idea about affordability. And then the only other thing is this business about the parking glare. It just yeah. seems so hard to do something that ought to be so simple. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Thank you. I just want to mention one thing. If you switch to 40 stories, you know that you have to do a new application and go back to the planning commission. And the CACs. Well, so much yeah. for getting this done quickly. <laughs> I mean, we've had, you know, we, we started exploring that today just yeah. to figure out from a process standpoint. Right. Um, and we'd be, you know, willing to obviously take that step. We 
had to do that in other situations. Um, but we can't offer anything until you close the hearing, <coughs> which will be the next meeting. I think we'll be prepared to introduce the condition we're talking about um, once that happens and you can see it. And I, you know, I'm just imagining I'm seeing a scowl over here, but I'm you know, just thinking of the <laughs> okay, reservation. You're going to have to have another public hearing. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Okay, okay. I was yeah, going to make sure I'm everybody's just, clear. No, no, yeah, sure. offering a condition that then will have to be we'll renegotiated back and again. Then, yeah, I'm not sure that's, you know, it's sort of a math problem, <laughs> but I just want to make sure that everybody knows if you put 40 on it now, you can't yeah, start again. a vote right. on Tuesday. Correct. Okay. But the, the good news is the reservations that the CAC had would be satisfied. Right. The anyway, reservations that we heard on the Planning Commission would be satisfied uh, obviously the interest in most if not all of the counselors to continue to uh, provide affordable housing downtown by some means would be satisfied so. somebody's going to bite off my micro units one time just some time, one time. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay well then if that's we'll just send it back to the okay I haven't heard any. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at these the conditions for. I really don't understand I, the staff um, shorthand on the. Could you put up the sure. your conditions again? Yep. One second. Uh, Is there a specific one? The last one on the parking. Okay. Uh, parking. You know, 75% of the top level shall be covered. That has nothing to do with lighting. I'm assuming. Well, it means that there wouldn't be lights emanating on an uncovered rooftop that okay. like you see in a lot of decks. But what you're saying is that 50% um, of the deck glare will be cast out to the public. Well, one thing I'll note, uh, and this was S9 Architecture, I think, really looked at that issue because of the comments. You know, we knew that glare has been an issue on some of these parking garages downtown. And that's what they suggested based on their design that we've been showing. Um, you know, one thing I'll, I mean, I see some of these, like we've had in the, in the parking, the, the headlights have no um, blockage. Right. And so this I think is they're. the Dylan is the problem. So I think there are differences. I mean, one is complete opaqueness, and then there's others, is just like making sure that there's a, uh, a structure that is blocking direct lights. I mean, that's always been an issue, like no direct light beams that you could see outside the building, whether it be a car or a, a light. That would be ideal, but that, I've not seen that accomplished yet. What about the parking? <laughs> Except for underground. <laughs> what about the parking garages at North Hills? I mean, In where? North, North Hills. Hills. There's towers at North Hills. I mean, they're up there and they're shielded. Now, by shielded, do you mean a, a fine grid? That, There's a grid there, yeah. Because obviously the Citrix deck is much more effective than the Dillon. The Dillon deck is almost completely ineffective. I've got pictures side by side at night. The Dillon is just a huge glare out in both directions. The, whereas the Citrix is very subdued, and what, so whatever that screening they use was very effective in capturing most of the light coming out of that deck. Uh, seems like we ought to be able to say match the screening effectiveness, not the exact material, but the effectiveness of the screening on the Citrix deck, and you really would have accomplished everything I'm concerned about. Well, we can certainly look at it. I mean, again, yeah, we try to go above and beyond any, any other um, with that, but I hear what you're saying, and it's not 100%, so we can. It's 50%. <laughs> well, 50% plus, whatever. Yeah, you know, the city does have, you know, uh, screening down the urban frontages. This does have an urban front. And I will say, like some of these other downtown projects do not have a shop front frontage because they, knew, they anticipated there were going to be some problems with the site. That, and there's some triggers with that um, urban frontage about parking the screening. Well. 
but I don't know if that's what made Citrix work out the way the Citrix did and mm -hmm. others. Right. So Mac, right. it sounds like um, people can get happy with giving you additional height to accommodate 15 years at 80% of AMI, it appears. I will just say to you that I'm not necessarily inclined to support that. I was um, more inclined to support the opportunity to have more units, not more height, but more units in a, in a, a more nuanced way that we haven't necessarily had here. But you can find that the micro units are effectively used in all big cities and growing urban areas. And so I would be not, I would be remiss to say that I wouldn't necessarily support um, support additional height. Okay, anything else? If not, then we'll move on to. So we're gonna do a motion on this one. We're gonna, okay, you gonna make a motion? Well, go for it. Try to get the sense of the committee here. Just getting them. Okay. Well, um, well, we reported back to full council with the recommendation that the uh, applicant continue to work towards uh, an affordable housing condition that can uh, be presented, but obviously not consummated. <laughs> in this round of this zoning case, uh, but at least can propose it as a step forward to bring it back in a new rezoning case. Obviously, it won't be a requirement at that point. At, at the next, when it gets reported back, uh, if you have to, um, but it can give the full council a sense that the direction you intend to take is not to ignore affordable housing and move forward with this case, but to refile more height conditions on affordability and so uh, is that your motion pool i know i know i got i got into a little bit into a little uh discussion yeah, we're not do a tangent. okay so we're going to report that. this out the recommendation that applicant will bring forward a proposal to bring a new zoning case that will include uh, affordable housing conditions consistent with the other ones we've seen recently as well as conditions to Just improve the, the screening of the parking is there a second to that? Second. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Opposed? No. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, we will move to um, tax change 1728, building height, civic building, residential zoning. Sorry, my computer's completely died. Uh -oh. <laughs> it is 1728, tax change, Thank building you. height, civic buildings, and residential zoning. Not dead, it just won't come up. And we do have a presentation to kick this off, and, and also members from the school district is speaking to you through a citizen's petition that then was referred. That's right. right. Thank so you, you first saw the, the introduction of this topic as the council meeting through citizen petition, and the request was fairly simple it was a request to take a look at the height regulations in our code as it relates to That's civic right. buildings and we'll talk uh, a little bit about what that means so as you know our code contains uh, height standards and height is measured in our code in, in one of two ways that are applied together it's feet and height and number of stories um, so in the residential zoning districts typically you'll find a maximum height is at 40 feet for residential structures you gain a little bit of additional height uh, for apartment building types or townhouse building types in the R6 and R10 districts respectively. Uh, and then civic buildings um, are permitted with a cap of, of three stories in all of our residential districts. So what the petitioner has asked of you is to take a look at that maximum measurement of feet and height in the residential zoning districts. So remember, capped at three stories, uh, they've asked to go above uh, the 40 feet, that would be a maximum. To something that's a, a bit greater than that, I believe what we heard was uh, somewhere around 55 feet or 60 feet, which would uh, obviously uh, increase the, the cap here uh, for uh, these type of buildings. So through the discussion, uh, the petitioner asked us to look at the civic building type. And as you know, when a developer comes forward and submits a development plan, uh, they choose the building type. And what we've said um, from the creation of UDO is that building type really isn't a solid construct, right? Building types could accommodate different types of uses. So if you think about 
what we normally refer to as a detached house. That's a form that could accommodate uh, residential, single family, it could accommodate an office. Uh, so there, there are uses that could um, flow in and out of building types. Civic building types a little bit different. So there is some uh, prescription to the uses that would be allowed within a civic building. So for instance, uh, you couldn't uh, come forward with a request to construct a civic building type and put a single family uh, unit in it. It's not permitted. Uh, so civic uses are um, defined as traditionally governmental type buildings, libraries, fire stations, police stations, schools, colleges, universities. Um, the building type goes further and, and allows things like rest homes and daycare centers, uh, life care and congregate care within that building type as well. So just as a reminder, building height is measured um, in terms of average grade around the, the totality of the structure, so all four sides, <laughs> assuming that it's a four-sided building, uh, taken into account and you get one average grade that establishes your height um, and then average grade is uh, again measured at every building facade and produces one singular number that was a, a change that we made uh, a year 18 months ago to the code in our pre-development grade right so that's that's correct there there's a distinction um, pre-development grade can be used in infill situations residential infill it's always pre-development grade um, the developer or applicant has the option of asking for a mass grading permit, which resets the grade. And, and mass grading typically happens on larger, more complex sites uh, where the, the site is completely regraded and uh, the elevations are reestablished there. So as we continue to have this discussion, first, no text change has been authorized yet. Uh, so that would really be the next logical step is to continue conversation and if you wish to proceed, authorize a text change. There are some considerations for you here. Um, obviously, the, the basic request is to change the measurement of, of feet and height for civic buildings. Uh, that can be accomplished very simply, but if there's concern about the impact that, that might have on adjacent properties, uh, there could be additional mitigation uh, measures that are taken into account, such as increased setback, uh, additional landscaping and buffering, could look at certain size properties uh, where this would apply. So there are a range of options that, that can be explored here if you would like to advance um, this discussion. So I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, we've got some representatives here from uh, the school district that might like to speak as well. So Travis, I have a, a question for you. So uh, the applicant may answer this, but well, I I'm gonna hold my question until after the applicant speaks. I'll be here. Okay, <laughs> yes. Your name and address for the clerk, please. Councilor Crowder, thank you for the opportunity. Kenneth Haywood again. I was before you a few weeks ago when I presented the original request to be able to begin this process for a text change. Um, I want to let you know that with me today, Marcella Rory, who is the Director of Facilities and Design um, and Planning for the School System, and Senior Director Betty Parker of the Real Estate um, Services and School System are here as well to help answer any questions and to facilitate the conversation we're having today. Where this request came from, for all of you to understand, is that as the school system has been either renovating or constructing new schools in the city, we've run to a situation where the school floor-to-floor -floor, um, dimensions are different for a civic building or a school than they would be for a residential unit. And so because of that, the three stories has worked out okay, but the actual 40 feet high height has been a problem because of that difference in terms of a um, school building versus the residence. So what we've been doing is going through the task with consuming staff time of filing a um, variance application for the, for the Board of Adjustment, having staff involved in that, going down presenting, having the Board of Adjustment approve the height request, and then going through that process. And so we started having conversations with Travis with Mark Collin and others to say, isn't there another way so that we're not consuming so much of the staff time in this process and just have certainty about what's going to happen as the school system continues. And so with that, the discussion came up about a text change at this particular district. And so as he's indicated, right now it's three stories of 40 feet. What we would like to be able to see in terms of a text change 
would continue to keep it at three stories, but go to 60 feet. So that way we believe based on the schools that we're now building um, across the county and also the city of Raleigh, that would meet that without having to go uh, back through a, a process in terms of a variance application with the city board of adjustment. Um, we have been talking to, to the city staff one of the proposals that has arisen from staff, which we certainly support and we do not have the issues with, is okay, if you need additional height above what now is 40 feet, and we're going to allow you to have 60 feet, then we're going to put in a couple uh, safeguards for the neighbors. One, we're going to add additional buffering requirements than what you have now. And when we just did West Millbrook, that's exactly what we did. We put in more buffering, I believe, than what the code requires along our neighborhood property. That wasn't an issue. We did it because we wanted to be able to, to buffer ourselves in terms of the building. In addition to adding additional buffering, there's also the suggestion to say, for every foot increase in height, you have a certain setback um, from the existing city required setbacks. And the information that Mark Holland presented to, um, to Tansy basically was saying, you know, one staff idea here is for every foot in height, you have a two foot further setback inward from the property line. We've looked at that. That is not objectionable to the school system in terms of going for a two for one um, setback for the height is something that we would um, have not any issue in terms of supporting in terms of that moving forward from the process. So we're glad to have the conversation with you today and would like for you to be able to recommend that this move forward with um, with the tax change through the normal city process and answer any questions you have, but we do believe that a tax change in terms of a civic building is the cleanest and best way in terms of going forward with this. And understand that we're not necessarily asking, you know, special treatment for the school system because we never try to do that. We're saying for civic buildings. So whether whatever that civic building may be, which obviously would include schools in your particular zoning category but that's what we would be looking for in terms of a height increase so you you have specific location where you want to build a civic building <laughs> the we do not right now have we just completed um, the approval process for Mills, West Millbrook so right now to my knowledge is there is not right now a current project that we are getting ready to file um, site plan approval for where we would need this but I need to check with my experts over here so there's not anything right now that's imminent, but we do think that while this is fresh in everybody's mind in terms of what we're going through with staff and the Board of Adjustment, it's an appropriate time to address it so that it can be in place the next time we do have a project to present to city staff. So I, I, I want to see public engagement in this process. And uh, so I want to be able to say, I want to be able to go out and find some examples and say, and talk to the people that live there and say, how would you feel if uh, you know this 60-foot tall building were built with these setbacks? And uh, and see what they say before I make any decision. Yeah, so, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, Ben. Just for me, I mean, to go from 40 to 60 in a residential neighborhood, I just I'm very concerned about that. And you know we're. And because we're not just talking about schools, we're talking about any kind of civic buildings, I think that can really have detrimental impacts on a residential neighborhood. And I have a lot of concerns about that. I think, you know, we're talking about a 50% increase in height. And I'm, that worries me. So I have a couple questions for you. I'm, I'm not necessarily opposed to the civic height change in the text change, but is there a reason why um, 60 feet is now a standard for schools can you can you just sort of explain to me is that based on uh, situations that have arisen that you're trying to address I mean is it sure sure let me ask Marcella to be able to address that because she is the one for the school system this is like I said in terms of design and, and planning this she knows a wall of all the different requirements I'm gonna let her try to address that okay uh, Marcella Murray 1420 on Rock Quarry Road um, Raleigh North Carolina and uh, as Kenneth mentioned a moment ago, uh, Director of Planning and Design for the school system, been with them about 22 years, a little bit over 22 years now. Um, in answer to your question, typically our um, floor to floor height for a uh, regular classroom tower would be about 14 foot five. 
and on average, our um, elementary, middle, and high schools, that would, that's roughly what we're running right now. In order to be able to build and provide all of the program elements, all of the on-site stacking that's required by NCDOT, MSTA, uh, to be able to provide the parking that's required, and then all of our program elements. So once we've gone through all of the, the program items that have to fit on a site, typically that has lent itself towards it, uh, going to a three-story building. What's a program element? Just for um, That would be uh, for middle school, and uh, Kenneth just mentioned the West Millbrook uh, Middle School site. It would be your um, main athletic fields, uh, your uh, football field, track uh, spaces, softball or baseball spaces. It would be um, at elementary, it would include your play structures, it would include your storage, uh, any of those items that are required in order for an elementary, middle, or high school to function. So that makes the 60 feet. I'm just trying. Yeah. I can't. I'll be honest with you, I'm not opposed to it, I think I, but I have yet to hear an answer why 60 feet for schools, and I'm listening to baseball fields and they're not parking. And parking. Well, especially I'm, for three stories. I'm just trying to understand. Okay. I mean, that's 20, that's 20 feet per story. I mean, it just seems, because you, you, you talked about three stories, unless you want to go four stories. Yeah. Well, right now, and I think part of it is to what you're trying to say, Councillor Crowder. So I may jump in and start it off. Is that because of all the things that either the state or the district requires in terms of the use of land, you have say a 30-acre piece of property. Because of all the different requirements, the program elements, you're left with a footprint to be able to build your school. And the only way to address the capacity issues is to go up. You're okay. not able to spread it out over 30 acres because all these other things are occupying right. your land. And their and their so and their requirements. But, but, yes. but why do you need a 60? Okay. Why do you need a 60 foot tall three story building? Yeah. Why do you have to go from 14 and a half feet per sto per story to 20? I mean, why why an extra five and a half feet in each story? When we took the West Millbrook Middle uh, project to the Board of Adjustment to request the variance for that one. Uh, you heard mentioned a moment ago that you're looking at your existing grades and taking an average of those because we're not going to fully grade that particular site because in this particular instance we are actually keeping the children in the existing building, building a new building on that existing site, moving them into that and then demolishing the existing building. So there, there are a lot of challenges with trying to balance how much grading you can do and keep a fully functional school in progress. So if we're looking at, say, a regular classroom, for example, and your minimum floor to ceiling height is about 10 feet, then I'm still looking at at least another four feet to five feet um, in order to provide my structure, my mechanical ductwork, uh, lighting, all of those pieces that aren't typically found, or at least not to this degree, in a regular residential building. So what we did there, again, we were still trying to work out all of the grades and because it's, again, so early in the process, that's where we landed between the pre-grade the pre uh, grades on that site or pre-construction grades on that site and then also the floor-to-floor -floor height and then knowing we needed to go to at least three stories, we averaged out, I think it was somewhere around 56 to 58. Betty Parker, uh, Senior Director of State Services, 1429 Rockwood. Floor to floor height is not the only dimension. There's also the dimension of the roof and the dimension of the foundation. So when you look at the structure in total, we've been pushing right at 55, slightly over 55. Uh, 60, I think, was a safe number that we felt gives us some latitude as grades, uh, grades are monitored and changing. But the last one, I think we ended up asking for a 55 foot. So that's that's the difference in where you're getting 45 feet and why are we asking for 55 roof and foundation thickness, bare foot walls and all. And so part of this is that it's not as though we Thank don't you. have a recent experience in terms of what the height needed to be. That's why we look at West Melbourne, which was which came out about 55 and 57, is a real life example of one that has recently been designed um, and is ready to be able to begin construction to say we're not just pulling 60 out of thin air. There is a life example to show why we needed 60. And in terms of Councillor Cox, I mean, I'm fine if we want to be, if this committee would like to be able to have staff work in terms of a tech change, send it through the Planning Commission for public hearings and allow an opportunity to move forward. 
Sure, we'll have public hearings and planning commission. Let them then move through back through the council again. You know, I, we have no issues with public hearings. We just believe that there is a need um, because of that. Let's, um, Travis said that when the UDO is created, there's flexibility to look at different heights. And this is one of those issues that we think is now necessary. Well, what about? I know we talked about civic buildings. That's a pretty broad category. Can we restrict this, uh, Madam Attorney, to just schools? Well, I yeah. think there's other needs. College, community college, university, civic club, museum, library, place of worship, mosque, synagogue, church, temple, police, fire, EMS, school. That's it. It's not a big number. Well, well legally, I mean, could you define a school out separately and have a different height limit for it? Yes, but Why? right now it's not done, so I think that would that would take a few more hoops to, to jump through. But Why would we do that, though, if we already, if it's already in the civic category? Because you're saying you can build all these different types of buildings to 60 feet tall next to residential, and I'm not prepared to go there. Well, Travis, let me ask a question. Is there a way to, in the mitigate, I, I feel like we can get there through levels of mitigation where Mr. Cox might feel uh, against a residential area, we might can mit mitigate it. Are there other things that you can look at besides the buffing, buffering through landscaping, I assume that's what we're doing, and um, <coughs> setbacks? Are there, uh, are there other things that you could craft um, in the language that could get council members comfortable? Mm -hmm. Sure, I, I think there are a range of options that we could explore. We haven't done so to date, but that's part of the drafting process. So right. if uh, the council ultimately would like to advance this, um, you could direct staff to look at options to bring forward uh, that would further mitigate and offset any impact. So well, I, would, I, I would rather have some community conversation first before we advance this to the text change process. Well, Where wonder, but but wonder, we, but no. wonder if we, but wonder if we yet the, but uh, well then, that, yeah, that's probably when you do it. Once you have something. But yeah. Mr. Cox, I might think that maybe at this point, since we could rely on our professionals to maybe bring back some options as it relates to ways we might mitigate that, we might come up with solutions that make um, the public hearing process go much smoother in terms of what is available out there that we haven't even thought of or that Travis may have in his head today we just haven't talked about. Um, that, I think, I that, think that might be a better process. I think it's fine for staff to come back with options. But I would still like to take it out to the public first and have a community conversation uh, before we advance this to the text change process. Because once we get to the hearing, we have to vote up or down one way or the other. And uh, there'd be enormous pressure to vote in favor of this. And and I think at this stage, this is something totally new. We're talking about res residential R4 districts, for example, uh, and going from 40 to 60, right next to um, you know single-family homes in R4. I'm not comfortable with that. I, I'm not either. And, and you know, the idea that additional landscaping could help doesn't. No. I, I don't see how. I if you're going it. from 40 to 60. You can't do landscaping to me that would mitigate against that. No. Yeah. Yeah. Let me also mention to you in terms of your address, your question, Councilor Cox, is the test case was was in terms of the public engagement was West Millbrook. We had to go through a quasi judicial hearing with the Board of Adjustment. We had the neighborhood meetings ahead of time. We had to go through what at least two engagements with the neighbors and CAC, we then had a citywide board of adjustment. Everybody who's interested to come and talk about this, we're asking for 55 feet. How many people showed up? Zero. Not a single person opposed our request for a variance of 55 feet. I understand that, but we're talking about a specific case versus setting policy that will allow any civic building to be built to those same standards throughout the 144 square miles of the city. I'm not comfortable with doing that. And, I, and I'm not necessarily challenging you in terms of how you want to be able to have the community engagement. I'm, what I am trying to do is that if we've demonstrated through West Millbrook that this height issue is something that is critical to be able to build schools in the city of Raleigh, 
and we don't really have a lot of options in terms of being able to reduce the height because of all the program elements that are now. We're trying to do a campus like West Millbrook where we're trying to keep the children instead of moving them off. Then if we don't do this, then what if? I think that's the other question here is the what if situation. The next time we do have a building that we need to build in the city of Rodgers High School that's going to require the type of height we're talking about. So I think that's why we're trying to be proactive. Mr. Stevenson. So uh, uh, let me just start back by asking for some more detail on the two proposals that are up on the screen. So when we say increase the building setback, are we saying uh, two to one beyond the existing required setback? Yes. Or are we are from the property line? Yes. That's the general thought right now is start at the minimum setback line. Okay. and then increase uh, two feet of setback for every one day. So for uh, side yard, a lot of these schools will be side yards to somebody, uh, their side yard to somebody because they'll have frontage on the street. So they're, they'll have a big side yard at, in residential zoning could be as little as five feet. This would be the residential setback on a side yard. I'm not certain I have that committed to memory. It's something we could look All right, to well, uh, well, I mean, it's 5 or 10, and there's some R6, it's an aggregate 15. So, I mean, but it's also a, a required landscape buffer on that edge. Okay, so now that leads to the second item. I want to get that in a second. Um, but so what that means is if it was 10 feet, let's just say it's 10, and we wanted to go 2 to 1 to get to a 60 foot building. Um, you're talking about additional 40 feet, so you're talking 50 feet total. So two, now is it two distance to one height or is it? Two distance to one height. Two distance to, okay, so it'd be? Above and beyond the 40 if it's R4. No, I'm, I'm just talking setbacks now. Right. And if we're going 60 feet higher and we're going to set back two to one on top of 10, that sounds like 130 feet. Is that right? No. 50 feet. They're talking about going above two feet for every foot above the 40 foot. Above the 40. Above the 40. Okay. Yeah. okay. Okay. So it would be 50. 50 feet. Okay. That's not much. Okay. All right. So, um, you know, just in terms, so let's go, let's talk about landscaping now. The code looks like for civic building in R4, actually in any of those, they're all limited uses. Uh, for residential districts, and it's an A1 or an A2 protective yard. So what does that really mean in terms of dimension and planning? I'll look that up for you real quick. Okay. Um, uh, okay. So, uh, yeah, a 60-foot tall building, 50 feet off of a residential property line, that's that's pretty imposing. Okay, so there, so you're looking at the residential transition? So these are the protective yards in Chapter 7. Oh, 7, okay. A1 and A2 are on the left side of this chart. Uh, starts at a six foot width for A1 with a requirement for a six and a half foot tall wall. Just because my eyes aren't that good, what section is so I can pull it up? This is 721. Protective yards, 724? One. 721. Sure. I'm looking at 724. I'm sorry. 724. Okay. All right. So an A1 is six, six feet, feet with some. With trees, uh, understory trees. Understory. So like great myrtles. Well, that's not. Oh, wait a minute. Is there a wall or a fence? What is that? A requirement for a wall. Wow. A six foot wall. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then an A2 is a 10 foot width with either a six and a half foot fence or wall with shade trees and other sort of trees. Why do you need okay. a six foot wall? You got a 60 foot wall. I was going to say, yeah. I was going to say, um, you know, so what's the proposal for increasing this? That is just, I mean, in terms of the, that was one of the staff recommendations. Okay, I'm, then I'm asking yeah. staff, what's the proposal so for increasing it? Right now, the, the proposal has not been fully fleshed out. Okay, At this All point right. in the conversation, staff is offering high level ideas for you to consider. So if we looked up at the the larger B2 type, is that kind of what you had in mind? It, it might be a potential compromise on increasing the landscaping? Here we are. Is that, is that question for Travis? Yes. That's the question, I'm sorry. 
So if we're talking increasing, would the B2 be in the realm of what you would imagine would be uh, proposed as an alternative to increase the screening from the A1, A2 up to the B2? So B2 certainly gets you more width, more trees, more shrubs. So if the intent is to increase the, the amount of landscaping, that, that would do it. So that would, uh, okay. But it's still only 50 feet. Uh, yeah, it's still only 50 feet, but it's now, instead of having a uh, parking lot 10 feet off the property line, we'd have a parking lot 35 feet off the property line. That may not work for you folks at all. I, I think a, a clarification of the information in the staff report is not intended to be a staff recommendation. Right. It's just a... No, no, the, but I think those are the two key points. Right. It's, it's like, set the heck and screen. Right. It, those are the big ones. So certainly if you were to, you could uh, make a recommendation that the council not authorize a text change. You could recommend that the council move forward a, a text change and include the concepts like a, or include in the staff mm -hmm. report or recommend that some alternative. So I'm trying to get things. to that last one, which is to say, let's at least try to bracket mm -hmm. this thing. If this one's not enough and we haven't decided what's too much uh, on, in terms of setbacks or screening, it'd be nice if we could try to bracket that a little bit before we send it out of here. So, so I, I'm sorry, but I, I'm just not gonna vote in favor of this text change. So, uh, uh, well, that's the question so, I'm asking is what would you well, find acceptable so they can get some I, sense of what I said I would find acceptable with it would be a, that we go back to the community okay. and right. have a further conversation about this I, I think it's premature to be advancing this to the text change process at this time so I have a slightly different opinion in that I would like our professionals to look at what might be options that they could bring back to your point Mr. Stevenson bracketed um, because there may be some things there that make it not doable for you guys. And, and the other part of this is land is tougher and tougher for the school system to be able to find mm -hmm. and purchase. And we are growing and I think we got to give some flexibility to our, to our partners in our school system to be able to facilitate uh, making changes that need to be made. And I do think that there's a way to get there through some mitigation issues that we haven't flushed out yet, and that's why we're here to decide whether or not that we want to ask staff to move forward with looking at what those options are. Absolutely. If I might respond to that briefly, when we had the Westmore book site, we offered additional setbacks, we offered additional buffering, we offered an additional pay fence, we offered a number of things because we want to be good neighbors. We understand that it's a looming structure but it's commercial construction versus residential. That floor-to-floor -floor height to maintain three stories is just bigger. So I, I'm so happy that we've had the opportunity to hear your comments and to collaborate with city staff who are far more knowledgeable than I am about this. But we're not here because we have to have it, because we need it today, or because we have a site in place. We're gonna have small sites that will never accommodate more than a two-story building, and we won't need this. Um, by the time we load it up with all the DOT required on-site stacking, all the stormwater requirements, and the program elements, there's just not room for a school bigger than a fuller yeah. or a style or something like that. We don't have it on the horizons, which is what we thought would be the perfect time to talk about this so that when that time comes, our biggest risk is when that time comes, if, if we haven't addressed it, three, four, or five, whatever the next school is, we end up addressing it right in the middle of the process, which runs the risk that without the variance, we have to completely shift gears. And we can't open schools any time in the first of the year. It's like being a little pregnant. It's either ready or it's not. And to have that sort of derailment of a huge project where capacity is so desperately needed is just not anything we want to do. So we're, we're trying to do it now in the cool of the evening when we have time to think about a lot of different options. Um, for us, it's almost a side-by-side -side basis. Plus, Millbrook was ample. We have plenty of room for setbacks. There may be others where we need to shade more in densifying the landscaping while we can honor the setbacks, but we may not be able to give quite as much extra width of buffers. So whatever we can come up with, we will work with. We will work with whatever comes up. We, we just recognize that this is going to be a continuing issue, and we've been very fortunate that the community and the Board of Adjustment has seen fit to support these requests when they come forward every time. 
So if with that level of consistency, it just made sense to think about codifying it in a way that balances the community needs with the commercial construction. Well, I, appreci I appreciate the comment that there isn't an immediate need. There's not. Okay, so what that says to me is that there is time to be able to have a community conversation about this issue before we proceed to a text change process. So my recommendation would be that uh, would be that we direct staff to take the next four months uh, to have a community conversation uh, about this issue in order to get feedback from the community about what the appropriate heights and setbacks should be uh, and and for the and for the uses is it just confined to schools or would it be confined or would it be open to all civic uses yeah. my, my concern particularly is about opening it to all civic buildings um if if we i mean my husband is retired from wake county public school systems both of my parents were teachers i my you know schools are important and i understand that the space crunch we have and everything else but I, I would not, I, I also feel very strongly about protecting neighborhoods and neighborhood character and 60 story civic buildings concern me. It sounds like with the school system, this wouldn't be happening that often. It would, maybe wouldn't be that big of a deal, but if we open it up to all sorts of civic buildings, I'm concerned that we really do have a very negative impact on residential character. And I'll, the conclusion, I guess what I'll ask, what I'd like is not to kill this tonight. Let's continue this <laughs> yeah. so we can have whatever conversation needs to be had, but please just don't say no, end of discussion. Let's do whatever further due diligence we need to to be able to have you know more information since we had the time to do it, and then we'll get in whatever forum staff believes that we can have this community engagement, sure, we'll have the community engagement so that you can check that box off if that's happened when it comes back to you um, and then we can then but I, I would like for us to somehow put some type of framework to understand you know, what is that period of time and then what's going to happen after that so that it doesn't just sort of get lost in Neverland in terms of this particular petition that would be fine and, and so I guess my motion would be to direct make a recommendation to direct staff to uh, uh, develop a uh, community process whereby we can discuss this issue further so that, so box so that would be a, pro a proposal of, of a joint process between city staff and the school district and that would come back to the council for consideration that would be and fine. direction that would be fine. second I have one question before I, <laughs> I call the question I don't have as much trouble as other people sitting here, but I just want to make sure you threw out the number of four months. I don't know where that came from. Um, <laughs> staff, I, 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 I took it. I mean, in my motion, I did not specify four months. I'll right. leave it to staff okay. and the right. school board to figure out what they think is appropriate. So my question to you is before I call for the vote, that doesn't preclude or hamper you in anything you need to be doing currently as it relates to making sure we have enough capacity. That's correct. Okay. With that, um, is there a second? I second. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Oh, with that said, we are, thank you so much to staff and everybody coming. Uh, we are adjourned.